I think I need to. <laughs> or to be a portion of the way in our journey, and I say I need to stop so that I can go to the restroom. All of us have these quirks, these, these imperfections, these, these idiosyncrasies about us, and, and, and very often they are the things that cause division among us because when those places that we are alike in, usually things move smoothly. But it's in those imperfections that we find differences. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, what will happen is that when we are experiencing our imperfections, we will draw distance between one another. Mm. When, 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 when we think differently about something, very often that's not the thing that pulls us closer together, but drives us further apart. Because then we say in our, in, in, in our own minds, well, well, I don't even want to be bothered with him right now about this because, because you think that way and I think this way. And, and when those things rise, <laughs> if we're not careful, we will we will allow space and distance to come between us if, if, if we don't arrange the space ourselves. We will allow it to come between us and therefore we get into this, um, this thinking and this philosophy that differences have to divide us rather than unite us. Mm. So... So then, theologically, when, when we ascribe that thinking to God, we tend to come up with the thinking that in my imperfections and my faults and in my failures and in my idiosyncrasies, God treats me the same way we treat one another. In other words, God's going to draw and, and, and cast distance between God and myself because of my imperfections. And the beautiful thing about God is that God doesn't treat us the way we treat one another. Preach, Pastor. God doesn't treat us the same way that we treat one another when we have our... What's wrong, Chris? You going to use that one? Okay. You're welcome, Chris. When we have when we have our idiosyncrasies and our imperfections, we tend to believe and think that God's nowhere around now and that God will distance God's self from us yeah, yeah. because I'm in a place of imperfection and I'm I, I'm exercising one of my idiosyncrasies and one of my, my quirks and my faults and in my failures, and therefore we tend to think that God's nowhere around when we fail. All right. Mm -hmm. But that's not how God operates. Yes, yes. We might operate that way. <laughs> oh, come on, fail at something and see how many people fall off. Uh oh. <laughs> All right, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm talking about like have a massive kind of humongous mm -hmm. kind of gargantuan type of failure mm -hmm. and see whether or not the phone calls become mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, see, see how many people fall off when you fail and see that may be how people respond. Yeah. But God is in the midst of our failures and our imperfections and our idiosyncrasies and our faults. He, he, he doesn't distance himself. No, we just got to know where to find it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because here we find Moses in the midst of a major, major,
major fault. Remember, Moses has chosen to become a murderer, has run from his run for his life from Pharaoh, is now in a place called Midian. And guess what? In chapter 3, we see God show up. Mm -hmm. That God has not distanced God's self from Moses. Yes. That even in the midst of Moses' imperfections, God is right there. Yes. That God does not deny Moses of God's presence. Although Moses messed up. Because see, you know how we, you, you, I mean, y'all know how we do. Somebody mess up, then all of a sudden, I'm through with them. And God's probably through with them too. And all the while, when we look at every hero, hero in scripture, they all messed up. All of them were imperfect. From Noah, we were looking at Peter this morning, <laughs> how fickle and crazy Peter was. When you talk about David, the list goes on and on and on of men and women who had major mess-ups and God was still in the midst of their imperfection. Thank you, God. So in spite of our character flaws, in spite of our faults, our failures, our imperfections, people might not want to be bothered with us, but that's not how God responds. God shows up in our imperfections. And we want to see in our text today that, that, that here's a man who has, who has messed up in a major way, but yet even in the midst of a Midian desert, God shows up in Moses' life. Moses, remember, is the man who who God is going to assign to go back to Egypt and lead the millions of Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and to freedom. And in the midst of this, God is still with Moses along the journey. In fact, the writer tells us that one day Moses is tending to sheep and this bush starts burning. And the bush starts burning, but the bush isn't burnt up. <laughs> Moses is curious about that. How can a bush be on fire but not be consumed? And as he goes to check out what's going on with the bush, he hears a voice coming from the bush. Moses, Moses. Here I am, the writer says. And the voice tells him, take off your shoes because where you're standing is holy ground. And this voice that's in the bush starts having a conversation with Moses. And Moses, in the midst of this conversation, and you gotta understand uh, 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 where, where, where Moses is, the, the intricacies of Moses' life has helped shape his imperfections. Because I understand, understand how, how Moses responds to the voice in the midst of the conversation and says, well, who am I? Mm -hmm. <coughs> who am I is is a question Moses has for God's voice that's coming from the bush. And we want to take a look at this because here is, 
here, here, here we can see how in the midst of his imperfections, God has not left Moses alone. Yeah. yeah. And that's comforting for us because even in the midst of us blowing it, mm -hmm. where other people might not want to be bothered with us, yeah. Yeah. that's not the way God handles us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see, let's see, let's see here in, 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 in this passage, in this, in this exchange, how God shows up in Moses' life. Well, one of the first things we see about God showing up in our imperfections is that God calls a meeting with Moses. There's, there's a meeting with God that Moses had. Remember, Moses is on the run. <laughs> but in the midst of being on the run, there's, there's, there's a meeting that has to take place. God needs to meet with Moses while Moses is in the midst of responding to this situation in an imperfect way. Ha! Moses has murdered an Egyptian. His lifestyle has become public because the word on the street was that Moses was a murderer. He leaves Egypt, goes to Midian, and now it's here in Midian that he has a meeting with God. Let's look at it here in verses 2 and 6. It's a really, really interesting thing here. Um, because the text tells us that there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, hmm, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And he says, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now understand something here about this, this meeting. The text tells us that, that Moses, remember Moses has now become a part of Jethro's family and he's tending to the flock, his father-in-law's flock, and he's out with the sheep, and in the midst of that, he encounters this sight of a bush on fire but not being consumed. And then there's a voice that comes from the bush calling Moses, saying, Moses, Moses, Moses says, here I am. Then there's this voice that says, don't come any closer, man. Take off your sandals, for where you're standing is holy ground. Then God identifies himself with something Moses can understand. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At the, in the midst of that, Moses realizes something. That, whoa, wait a minute. All right. This is God yeah. Yeah. talking to me in the midst of a bush that's on fire in the middle of a desert in a place called Midian, which is a long way from where I lived. Yeah. And now I live here. Yeah, yeah. God has to have a meeting with Moses. See, that's one of the things that we have to always hold on to, that even in the midst of our faults, our failures, our imperfections, our idiosyncrasies, our quirks, and our crazy ways, those things do not negate God showing up in our lives. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. No matter how many times we've dropped the ball, no matter how many times we've fumbled, no matter how many times that we've lost it, no matter how many times that we've made bad decisions, that does not negate God's desire to show up in our lives. Thank you, 
In fact, I would venture to say it's more so then that God really needs to hold a meeting with us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, he doesn't treat us like people treat us. All right. People distance themselves from us when we, when we fall and fail. God draws closer to us yes. when we fall in faith. Yeah. He's, he's, he's in the midst of this bush having, and the bush is on fire, and he has to identify himself to Moses so that Moses could understand that this is a supernatural experience you're having right now. Yes, yes. Because in the middle of a desert for a bush to be on fire is no big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's hot. The weather is hot and the areas are dry. But for a bush to be on fire, not be consumed, and there's a voice emanating from the bush. All right. Not a natural occurrence. I mean, how many bushes have you had conversations with lately? Okay, not, not, I mean, not a natural occurrence. So in the midst of this this, this situation, this experience, God has to identify himself to Moses so that Moses understands who he's in conversation with, who he's in a meeting with. All right, all right. He asks, so he tells, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and once Moses heard this, yeah, yeah. he has to hide his face because he realizes who he's in conversation with. And see, that's the beautiful thing about God. Is that God, I mean, isn't it crazy that God would choose a bush in the desert to hold a meeting with Moses? But see, what God will do is God will meet you right where you are. Thank you, God. I don't care if it's in the crack house. Okay, I don't care if it's out on the corner. I don't, I don't care if it's in the hotel with somebody. You know you ain't got no business. <laughs> God will meet you right where you are yes. to have a conversation and a meeting with you so that he can redirect your life. Mm. See, even in our faults, God doesn't even waste our faults and failures. All right. We tend to look at failures as a bad thing. Because that's how we treat one another when they fail. And we, we begin to ascribe that same kind of treatment to God. God doesn't handle us like that. Yes, yes. God doesn't handle us the way we often handle one another. All right. So he has this meeting. He has this meeting with Moses. And Moses realizes something, that there's something supernatural going on here. Moses hides his face because he's, he's afraid to look at God. Well, see, God shows up in our imperfections by having and holding and hosting and calling meetings with us. Mm -hmm. But not only that, God will also have a message for us in the midst of our faults, our failures, our imperfections, when we drop the ball, when we've blown it. That's why we can't discount failure. We, that's why we can't be afraid of failures. Yeah, yeah. Because failures are opportunities for God to have a meeting with us, mm -hmm. but also to get a message to us. Thank yeah. you. Because look at verses 7 through 9. Look at what, what, what the, the, the writer shares with us. The Lord said, mm -hmm. now check out this. I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. I mean, listen to this. This, this is what God is sharing with Moses. So I have come down to rescue them 
from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, yeah. a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, and, 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 and he does warn them that it, right now it's the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. See, what, what God shares with Moses is a message. He has a message for Moses. And that's why very often when, when we just allow failures to just kind of casually go by and not, I know it's painful, it's painful when we, when, when we have to look at why we fail, how we fail, what, you know, how did, how, how did things turn out this way? Uh, it's, it's, very often it can be painful to have to do that, but it's in doing that that we get the message from God. Yes. If I just kind of ignore faults, failures, my imperfections, my shortcomings, and if I just kind of let them go and ignore them, very often I may miss a message God has for me in the midst of my failure. Yes. Yes. He says to them, I've, I've seen in, uh, uh, the, the, the misery I've heard their cry, and I'm concerned about their suffering. And he's sharing with Moses that, look, I'm coming down now <laughs> to see about them and to, to give to them a vision for a better future. That we're going to going to take them out of Egypt and lead them to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a land that is spacious and good, flowing with milk and honey. In other words, the message is, is that there's something better than this. Mm. Mm. I know, and I know that, that very often when we when we experience failures in our imperfections, we tend to think the opposite. That because I blew it, I'm going down. Oh, man. God don't want to be bothered with me. And people don't want to be bothered with me. So if people don't want to be bothered with me, then God doesn't want to be bothered with me. So I can't go up. I gotta go down. Oh man. And what God wants Moses to understand is that even in 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 in, in your imperfections, in your idiosyncrasies, and you, yeah, yes, there's been faults and failures and shortcomings. I have something better. Yes. All right. Thank you, God. Yes. But then he tells them, it's a, he tells Moses, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. But right now, it's under other ownership. What that means is that there's a land that you're going to, All right. but it's occupied by somebody right now. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, you'll have to work mm. to get that mm. which is better. Mm. See, 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 it's it's not that yeah you 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 fail you fall in and and and. and 
and you messed up, and that's okay. I'm just going to give you better. No, you don't have to work. Mm. To get back up. Yes. And occupy that which is better. Yes. yes. Yeah. That, that, the, the, the message yes. God has for Moses is that, yes, yes, you're, I'm, you're, you're they're going to go to a different land, a land flowing with milk and honey, but right now it's occupied by somebody else. Yeah, yeah. In the midst of Moses' failure and his imperfection, God shows up, has a meeting with Moses, has a message for Moses. The last thing, though, is that God gives Moses a mission. Mm. And you see, for so many of us, we are reserved hesitant, reluctant is the word I was looking for, to live out our mission <coughs> because we've messed up before. So God couldn't possibly have a mission for me because I've messed up before. have something better for me because I've blown it before. That's how people think. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And you cannot ascribe people's behavior to the way God interacts with us. God has a meeting with Moses, a message from Moses, and now he gives Moses a mission. Moses is the dude that's on the run. Yeah. He's the one who's blown it. He's the one who has, he's got a body on his life. That he's killed someone, murdered someone. But let's look at, let's look at the message because you have to go. So verses 10 through 12 says, so now go. I am sending you, good God, to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you, that when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Mm -hmm. Here, God gives Moses a mission. That yes, in the midst of his running, he says, so now go. I'm sending you back to Pharaoh to bring my people out of bondage in Egypt and take them to the land that I told you about. Yeah. Yeah. Moses' response is understandable. Who am I? Mm -hmm. Remember, this is a guy who was born into one culture raised in another culture, now lives in a third culture. All right. This is a guy who's born Hebrew, raised as an Egyptian, yeah, yeah. but now lives in Midian. Yeah. And you have to understand the internal conflict of Moses. Who am I? Because sometimes the situations and circumstances of life can have us confused. Yeah. Sometimes the intricacies of life can lead to some of our idiosyncrasies that we develop. 
life. He's born Hebrew, but raised up around people who I know there's something different. Then has to leave there, that land that he's accustomed to, and he's now in another culture, the Midianite culture. So when God comes to him with this mission, he's like, well, who am I? Yeah. That I should go. Because see, as mixed up and as messed up as my life has been, I already have one body on my name. And as mixed up and as messed up as my life has been, and with the faults and failures that I have, who am I? That you got a mission for my life. All right, all right. Thank you, God. Mm. God says, I'll be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. He says that when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship them, you'll worship God here on this mountain. My brothers and sisters, this is something we have to really understand. That it's not about what happened to you that dictates what God can do through you. All right, all right. Preach, Pastor. It's, it's, it's not about that. It's not, it's, not, it's not about how horrible and how messed up and how unfair and how, how difficult life has been. That's not the determining factor on God giving you a mission for your life. Thank you, yes. Yes. Preach, Pastor. The mission Preach. for your life is so totally dependent upon the one that created you. Thank you, yes. Not the stuff that has happened to you. Yes. So therefore, when things happen to me and stuff in life yes. starts to knock at me, yes. I know it's not about that stuff. It's about the one that created me and has a mission for me. So yes, I've messed up. Yes, I have imperfections. Yes, I have idiosyncrasies. But those are not the determining factor for what God has for my life. Yes, yes. What determines that is him. Yes. Because, see, you know, you know how it is with people. You know how people will, well, if you're not perfect, then obviously God can't use you. Now, that's, that's the standard we hold people to. That's not the standard we hold ourselves to. <laughs> We hold ourselves to our intentions. Mm. And we hold people to the standard of their actions. Mm. <laughs> so, 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 so we're discounting people who God has already included them in the equation. Yes. <laughs> we're writing. We can have the unmitigated audacity at times to write folk off who we don't think God can use. And all the while, what God has for them is for them because it's come from him. It's not about what happened to them. You see, when God, when God gives us life, and the more that you live life and the more you experience life, God has a way of life for us. He tells him, look, that now you're going to lead them out of bondage. And when you come out of bondage, you're going to worship me on this mountain. Going to take them and lead them, this millions and millions of people, out of bondage. 
And when you come out of bondage, you'll worship me on this mountain. I know, yes, you're the one who murdered one of their people. You're going to go back to those people, tell him to let your people go. I mean, can you, underst can you understand the implications of all of this? We raised you. We took you in and nurtured you. You went to our schools. We fed you and we took care of you. And now you have the, God, the, the, the audacity to come back and tell us to let those people go that have been laboring and building for us. Yes, God has a mission. And no matter how much life may come against us, do not allow that to cut your mission mm. short. Yes. Mm. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Don't allow. Thank you, God. My faults. Thank you, God. Failures. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. The difficulties of life, the things that have happened to me, to cause me to give up on my mission. <coughs> See, in the midst of those things, God, God has a message for you and a mission. Everybody's life yeah. matters to God. Yeah. 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 Everyone's life matters to him. And there's a mission for everyone. But sometimes we allow the craziness of life to dictate and deter us from living out our mission in life. He wants to take them from being a people in bondage to being a free people who will worship him, who will live a certain lifestyle. <coughs> See, <coughs> the lifestyle of being in bondage is different than the lifestyle of being free in Christ. It's two completely different ways of living. And if we're not careful, we can get used to bondage and think bondage is the norm. And then when, when there's the opportunity to experience freedom, freedom becomes frightening because bondage is what I'm used to. God shows up even in our imperfections. God doesn't waste time, problems, faults, failures, shortcomings. God's not, God's not just in the successes. Yes. God's in the failures. Yes, he too. is. Yes, he is. You know, and because, and see, see, and that's why we get so crazy and so like, God deliver me, God deliver me, God deliver me, and want to get delivered so quick. And what he's trying to do is develop you. Yes. Yeah. But we want the deliverance, not the development. Yes. Preach, Pastor. Because we think that the development must be something wrong. God uses right and wrong to his glory. Yes. <laughs> God loves us so much that even in our imperfections, he's right there. Thank you, God. To help us, to, to guide us, to meet, to meet us right where we are. And it doesn't matter where. God doesn't have a problem meeting you in the worst of worst places. I know sometimes we think God only show up at church. <laughs> it's like, man, if we could get beyond that. Even in the dirt, in the muck, in the messiness, God will meet with us and give us a message 
and even a mission if we're looking 